Yeah, welcome to uh, Open Goal. Another great guest, um, the Simon I wish I was. Simon Donnelly, you're like a Herbalife version of me, mate. I've not had Herbalife since January, mate. Are you off it, yeah? yeah I'm off it, aye. I was going to say you could use this as a before and after. <laughs> <laughs> um, grew up in Burnside, mate. Yeah. I don't know if you know, but I feel like I've been recently, I saw Boys for Castle Milk and around about Castle Milk I've been interviewing. Yeah. I'm starting to feel like the post. <laughs> <laughs> How was that growing up, man? Burnside, good? Ah, it was good, mate. Uh, started off in Rutherland, moved up to Burnside, uh, seven or eight, but. Ah, good area to, to, to live, you know, lots of parks around about, you played football with your mates, so that nah, was good. And then what happened, was it Queen's Park that picked you up for a young age? Aye, Queen's Park, an un unorthodox start for me, you know, no kind of coming through pro, pro youth or boys clubs or stuff, I was playing with the BBs and school football, mm -hmm. uh, and went along to Queen's Park with a mate, you know, just, I think his brother was playing in the first team, went along and we were playing, you know, we were sitting in Hamden with that car park out there, it was Ash at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think we had street lights, you know, that was where the reserves and the, the under 18s trained. So I was here for six months, didn't play in the first team, played a few games in the reserves, did all right and got the move to Celtic. So you coaching then, what, what did it consist of? What, what sort of coaching would you get when you first came into Queen's, uh, Queen's Park? Uh, I remember running around that track with Eddie Hunter, you know, it was pre-season at one point and I remember him just telling me to lift my legs and I couldn't lift my legs, going round the ash track there and up and down the terrace and, but... The stuff with the ball was just, it was simple stuff, just football, just football games and passing and, you know, just working on your technique. Uh -huh. And then, did you play against Celtic? How did Celtic say you play? Was it a scout? It's living the else side, it was just, I, I was playing with the reserves on the Saturday morning, Reserve League West, midweek. I must have been doing all right, because you hear wee whispers, you hear, you know, who so and so is interested and Celtic and Rangers apparently were interested at the time. And Tommy Craig's boy was playing with Queen's Park at the time, so he was at a lot of our games, you know, you could always see Tommy standing there. You never know the connection, but, you know, I get asked to go to play in a, a under-20s tournament in Geneva. So I'd go in and train for a week at Celtic Park and then go to this tournament. So, you know, I couldn't knock it back. Yeah, what sort of players would it say again, anyone would know? Aye, the level went up for me straight away. Stuart yeah. Gray was there, Brian McLaughlin, Barry Smith had just broke into the first team, you know, you just went in there and immediately you go in, the first team had finished for the season, so we're in the first team dressing room at Celtic Park. It's just brilliant. You're playing with these boys that, again, are a level up. Uh, it was just a fantastic time, you know. We played, uh, <coughs> ironically enough, it was Queen's Park. We played up at Helenville. I don't know if you remember the old Helenville. No. It was like a concrete car park. Right. First Astro. We played Queen's Park. Uh, this was the week leading up to Geneva. Played Queen's Park. And I did all right. I scored a hat-trick. And I remember seeing Liam Brady up in the terrace and he'd obviously decided to come along and watch it. I thought I've done all right there, I've not done myself any harm. Went away to Geneva and didn't really do well, you know, you, when you've done well yourself. Mm. Didn't do well Geneva, didn't score a goal, came back and thought maybe I'd kind of blow my chances. I think it was Benny Rooney who said, we want to sign you. And I'd always thought it was on the back of Liam, you know, being there and seeing us, seeing this young boy, we need to sign him. But I've started doing a wee bit of Celtic part this year, you know, with the Celtic TV and hospitality. Mm -hmm. So within that, you get to meet all the old boys again, all the Lisbon Lions, George McCluskey, and Bobby Lennox, who was one of my first coaches. So I'm sitting there early on this season with Bobby, and he says to me, I remember your first game. And I was like, all right, what's he going to say here? Because Bobby's getting on a bit, but he's still sharp. And I'm thinking, right, I hope he gets the right game, because I don't want to correct a Lisbon line here. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, it was at Helenville, at Queen's Park, and I couldn't believe it. I thought he was going to maybe talk about my first senior game. He says, you scored a hat-trick, and I turned to Benny and I says, we need to sign this boy. So it was like, all these years I'd thought it was Liam, uh -huh. but it was Bobby Lennox. Brilliant. How was Liam Brady? Was he a good manager? Brady was I. I never really had a lot of dealings with him because I never broke in under Liam. Uh, I remember doing, you know, pre-season, you know, with the first team. Everybody would do pre-season together, him and Joe Jordan. Joe Jordan would be up the front, quite fit. But I never had a lot of dealings with the first team at that time. All, my time at that time was like, with Benny and Bobby, Tam McAdam, Frank Connor, you know, the reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, so I never got to experience the first team level when he was there. So was, it was it under McCarry? McCarry first... gave me my, my debut, aye. And what was that, just playing well for the reserves, McCarry called you up? Aye, more or less, you know, down at Barrafield, which you know yourself, yeah. two pitches, reserves on one side, first team another, you're, which is a great setup because you're always looking over and going, I want to be there. And uh, again, another wee story just... I think McCarry came, we were shooting after training one day and McCarry came over and he says, put it in the top corner and I put it in the top corner. And he says, can you do it again? It was done at now the Celtic Supporters Club, mm -hmm. remember it? Put it in again. And he walked away and I'm thinking, 
the hundred shots before were going everywhere. <laughs> it just happened to be the two. And I was training with the first team within a few days. And that's just wee things like that. That's how it came about. It's mad how it just to be incredible. Bits of luck can incredible, change incredible, but it's a true story that I mean, uh -huh. he just came over and as I say, I'd been practicing, boys were going everywhere. And those two just happened to get in the top corner, right place at the right time. And how were the first team were well, young lad moving up? The good guys? Yeah. Aye, brilliant. Brilliant. Well, what, what sort of guys was, would have been there? McStay. McStay. How Peter good Grant. was he? McStay was brilliant. Brilliant. One of the best I've played with. But classy guy as well, you know, on and off the pitch. And just, you know, looked after us when I, I first broke into the first team. Grant, he would look after you in a different way. He'd always be pulling your leg. Uh, John Collins, model pro. Just good senior pros to, to come into it. Made it easy for me. I don't know if you watched Frank McAvenny's interview, but he loves Lou McCarry. No, I'm kidding you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, a lot he of the boys... Bad, did, what did, what did, did you think? Well, I did a thing at the weekend there, a, a dinner with Tam Boyd, and, and he doesn't look back formally in that time either, but... Oh, I, oh, I look back and I was 19, and I'd been there 18 months, and I wanted to play in the first team. I wanted to say I, I'm a Celtic player, and the guy gave me my chance, so... For, for that, I'm grateful, but I can appreciate the other side if I was maybe... You know, a senior side of it, and I'd seen and worked under certain managers. Maybe it wouldn't have been for me, but I was 19, wet behind the ears, and he gave me my debut. Someone I always ask the boys, do you remember your debut? Aye, it was Easter Road, and it was a terrible nil now I think. Did, but did you know a couple of days before that you were going to play, or was it just no, the day of the game? No, <coughs> I think pulled? John Collins in the week leading up, so after that wee bit with McCarry, get into the first team, I'm training with the first team again, the levels are up again. Finding it easy because you're playing with better players. Mm -hmm. And it was John Collins said to me, you be ready for the weekend. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Be ready. He says, you're going to be involved, be ready. And I went home that afternoon and I get phone calls off all the press. And I was in the house with my sister and my mum and dad are teachers. So they were, they were out and I'm kind of, this is all new to me. You know, the press are phoning. And sure enough, that weekend I was in the squad, came on for I think Charlie Nick, uh, played wow. the last 20 minutes. What was Charlie Nicholas like, good guy? Different class. Again, you talk about learning off people. Charlie was coming to the end of his career. <clears throat> Wasn't he particularly quick, but everything was up there. He could move a yard that way and take the defender that way, knowing that he wanted to go there. And you just, you learn off these guys. You learn off them. You don't need to be sprinting here, there and everywhere. It can be a yard or two yards and just playing with them. I think I actually made my, I think he started in my first start. I think it was me and him up front, which... Playing with Charlie Nick. Would he take you aside and tell you things and help you with things now? Not so much. You just watch him. Mm -hmm. You just watch him and pick things up for playing with him, doing little things and watching him. But that huge thing for me was doing things a split second before the defender. You know, if you wanted the ball there, you were, he was kidding on, he was taking you that way and then going in there. He, mm -hmm. was, he was class at that. He was champion, Charlie, wasn't he? Did, <coughs> he ever get, did he ever take you out in the tin? I, I remember being a Christmas night with him and asking him, you know, I had a couple of jars in me, so I Plucked up the courage. Why, brave pills, uh -huh. why did you go to Arsenal? I had a Liverpool and Man U. And at the time, well, I think obviously the, the London nightlife might have been one of the reasons, but he, he said to me, I can't remember the strike force at Man U at the time, but it was Dalglish and Rush at Liverpool. And he said, How was I going to break that partnership? You know, I, I could see myself playing at Arsenal more than I could see myself playing at Liverpool. Even though I think he would have maybe broken at Liverpool, I think he's. After a few games as well, we McCarry dubbed you the new Dalglish. Uh -huh. No pressure, eh? How did you feel when you heard that? I've been, I, I, I wasn't bothered. I wasn't Were you bothered. not there? No, no. Uh, I was most, most confident when I was on the pitch and mm -hmm. Dalglish was my hero growing up. You know, I was I came here to watch Scotland with my dad and it was drummed into me, Dalglish, 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 to the point where I was old enough to appreciate what he did on the pitch, to the point where he tried to take these things of his game. <clears throat> I just took it as a compliment. You know, I get the piss ripped out me in the, the dressing room for it, obviously, and guys in the street, but it didn't really bother me. It didn't put any pressure on me performing. Were you always a confident kid? No, no, I was a shy kid. Mm -hmm. Shy kid, but I, I was more confident on the pitch because I believed in what I could do. You know, that's what I did. I was obsessed with football for, you know, an early age, so that's where I was most confident. Andy McLaren said that as well. He said that when he got on the pitch, it was just, <coughs> that's where he felt most yeah. confident. Do you think kids nowadays don't have that? Some kids, I think, you know, with everything that's built up nowadays, football's such a, a huge thing commercially and it's all over the media and everything now. You know, it takes away for just the, the simple, the simplistic game. Just go and play football with a ball and enjoy yourself, play with your pals in the park or whether it was the streets back in Maddy. You know, there's, there's a lot of pressure on kids nowadays and I always say when people say, what, what's your, enjoy it, just 
practice as much as you can, but enjoy it. Uh -huh. Five goals in 12 games at the start. What was that doing? Was it playing with better players, as you said? Playing with better players, but I, <clears throat> I said this uh, before. I found it easy when I came in. I, I scored two goals in my debut, and I found it easy. And I thought, I kidded myself on, or <clears throat> thought wrongly about it. I thought, this is, this is easy. The next season proved when we came to Hamden that it wasn't easy. You know, I had a lot of injuries and didn't score a goal. You know, so it was just wee bits in the learning process. I'd came in, hit the ground, young kid, no any worries. Fortunate enough to get a few goals, thought this is what it's always going to be like. Mm -hmm. And get swiftly brought back down to after that. So season. is it when you do well, is that when it starts to get harder? Because there's the expectation no, when you people, know the you. <coughs> people know about you. People know about you. Defenders, you're not the new kid in the block. They're like, right, that wee guy's not going to get that again. You know, I'm going to go through him the next time and mm -hmm. different things. And then I begin to think, you know, and put pressure on myself. So I say the second season here was was awful. We played at Hamden Park. I think we went a run of 17 games where we only won three or something, which is ridiculous for Celtic, but it shows you the level we were at. And I was finding it hard. You know, I don't think we had a lot of strikers. I'd been seen as the, the next best thing coming in. And I had injuries. And as I say, I went through the whole season. I remember Peter Grant saying to me, he, he'd one goal. And I remember he said to me, it's the only season that he's beat a striker at Celtic, <laughs> oh, no. which just nailed me. Cheers, Peter. Thank just you very much. Me. Me. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the games you were involved in was the Rangers game, where there was Aye. no Celtic fans there. Yeah. Was that a weird weird atmosphere? It was. I, well, I hadn't experienced anything other than that. I'd been at other games, you know, mm -hmm. uh, watching at Celtic Park, you know, on the ground staff, but I'd never experienced playing in it. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed getting into the, the Lions Den with many Celtic supporters there. You know, it was just us and the, the staff and the, the plane that flew over, you know, saying, hell, hell, we're here. Mm -hmm. You knew you had the back in there, and we were just in there to do a job, but I, I quite liked it, and we, we put on a decent performance. I think Mikhailachenko scored a deflected equaliser late on. Mm -hmm. How good, how quiet was it, though? Like, could you hear was, John Collins telling himself he was the best player in the world? <laughs> <laughs> With the predator boots on. <laughs> Looking like, at him all, you know. Uh, it was him that scored, didn't it, John Collins? He scored, he did it that year, and he did it the, sec the, the same free kick, two years in the trot, but it just went silent. I think we all piled on him. You could hear us all screaming, and you could hear the dugout, nobody else. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was a, a surreal experience. See, on Macario leaving, there was rumours, obviously, him and Fergus McCann didn't get on. Mm -hmm. Did the players know that? Did they feel that? See, to be honest, because you primed me with that question, I, I, I thought about it. Uh, I didn't really participate in that. I was just a young kid coming in. It was all kind of, oh, see, all the political stuff mm -hmm. and all that stuff, you kind of left it to the experienced players. I was just in the team and just happy to be playing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was happy when Tommy Burns came in because I'd worked with Tommy at under 21 level and I loved his training. Mm -hmm. So... I was excited when he, he took over, but I wasn't too, I wasn't too caught up in you know our performances at the time. Lou, Lou took over at a difficult time in the in the club's mm -hmm. uh, career. You know it was it was difficult times in the early nineties. We we're playing against what I think is the best Rangers team of all time. It was hard. Mm -hmm. See how you said that about the older players back then. What goes on today is obviously older players have got a big <coughs> say with managers and stuff like that. Would it have been the same back then? I think so. in that, would they went to McCann and maybe said McCarry wasn't the man for the job? I don't know if they would have went that far. That far, I don't think so. I think, I think the guys at the helm would have realised things weren't working out and they wanted a they wanted a change. I don't think. I mean, Paul's a classy guy. I don't think he would he would do things like that. Uh, but I don't think there was a a, a bond between McCarry and the and the senior pros. Why do you think that was just his attitude? I don't know. I just I heard stories that he wasn't always there. I can't remember that, but he wasn't always there and. You know, he wasn't as warm towards them. Whatever reason, you know, they, you could feel there was something there, but for whatever reason, I, I was just happy to be involved at the time. Mm -hmm. And then the total opposite guy comes in, Tommy Burns. How much did the boys, the, the, all the boys, you said you were buzzing, but were all the boys buzzing aye, when Tommy aye, got the job? Aye, because the boys have played with him. Mm -hmm. McStays and Grants had played with him, and Big Starkey as well, and oh, just the type of person Tommy Burns is, who, who couldn't like him, you know, and... and the football he wanted to play <clears throat> and the way he was with the young boys as well. For me, a huge role in my development, not only just coaching me and wee points, but the boys that he was bringing in, the Van Hoydonk, Sandy Toms, he was bringing in quality. Mm -hmm. You know yourself, you're playing with better players, your game gets lifted, your confidence gets boosted. So all that, the whole package, was a huge role in my career. Uh, so you know, just on the training field, would he pull you aside and speak to you a lot? Aye, I took, it was like me, Jackie, we Eddie, Shooty Gray, we'd take five or sixes back in the afternoon. They would bamboozle you with it and it would just be like wee simple stuff like triangles on your side of the pitch. Just working through simple stuff that was all game related and you could 
take it in easy. You know, nowadays you look at things and it's as if they're trying to land aeroplanes with cones everywhere. It was simple stuff that you took in and you could take into the game. See, that fun side of him, though, obviously when he coached us as kids, he could still have that, the, the pattern <coughs> and I'll laugh at you. Was it, was it similar with the first team or did he need to be more? No, he was, no, he would, he would, he would kill you straight dead with humour. He, he, yeah. he would nail you, aye. He would and for all the boys, eh? No, huh? 100%. You know, if, if it had to be done, he, he could lose the rag, don't get yeah. me wrong. He was, he was good at doing that as well, but his humour was first class. He could put somebody down if they needed to be put down at that, you know, if he thought they were getting above their station. Mm -hmm. He could nail you with his humour. Well, um, you said obviously the highs are scoring 5 and 12 and then the lows are getting injured. How hard is that as a young kid when you're in the first team and you're picking up injuries all the time? Well, you go for one, you go for thinking this is brilliant, this is what it's always going to be like and you see the other side of it uh, at an early age. But I, I kind of took it at, at that point as an opportunity because I'm a wee guy like yourself. But I went into Cheers the gym, me, I went into the gym <laughs> and blasted the gym, uh -huh. you know, and came back stronger. Uh, but again, that season wasn't going too well. Uh, so it's the only positive. Nobody likes to, you know yourself, nobody likes to be injured. Uh, was that I, under Tommy when you were getting these injuries? Aye, just when he came in. And how was he when, obviously, you said you weren't scoring goals, you were injured picking up injuries? No, he was fine. He was fine. He actually took me, and it was the best thing he did for me because he took me, I'd always regarded myself as a striker, playing up top. And maybe through the injuries and stuff, I remember him taking me aside the following pre-season and saying, look, I've had a wee think about it, I'm going to play in midfield, I'm going to play on the right. He says, I don't think you're big enough yet or strong enough yet to go and lead the line. Mm -hmm. I'm going to play you there and you can link for there and I think you'll get more of the ball there. It was the best thing he ever did for me because I went back there, he signed Jackie and that season was an absolute joy to play in. You know, yeah. some of the football, we, we signed Big Pierre towards the end of the, the season before, Andy Tom came in. There was some... You know, it was a, it was brilliant to play in that season. I think we'd get beat once, too many draws, obviously. Never. But they signed him. Was that when the momentum changed when he signed these sorts of players like Pierre and Andy Tom? Pierre was definite. Aye, Pierre was. <coughs> we'd we'd good players. The hat and everybody. Who's the hat? Next day. All oh, right. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, we had good players there, John Collins, but bringing Pierre in was it was just kind of raising the bar a wee bit. You know, we were going to start bringing in players of that ilk. And it just improved the team, you know, we were bringing Stubbsies at the back and it, everything was just going and you get a buzz off it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, it's sell to every year, you have to, even if you've had a, a great season, you have to do it all again, you know, they bring these players in. But at the same time, it gives you a wee lift because you're like, these guys are good. You know, we're bringing in some quality here and Pierre for me, Pierre's up there with, with Henrik for me in terms Is of Is he? Huh? Quality, How, aye. That good? Aye, aye. What was, he, what was he good at? Just hold up playing... Just his intelligence, his link, his free kicks. If you look at his goals to game ratio everywhere he's went, it's unbelievable. He's played at a semi-final of a World Cup and I still hold Henrik as the best I've played at, but Pierre's no far off him for me. The big man had some set of nasters as well, didn't he? He did, and he had that dodgy wee tash <laughs> when he first came on off. <laughs> Freddie, tash. Freddie Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what kind of guy was he? Pierre was a great guy, good humour, liked to... Liked a night out. Did he uh, like a night out? Aye, aye, in the tune? Aye, aye. Who'd be the usual suspects on night out for that team? Oh, I think Stubbsy told you. Uh -huh, Elko Vaughan? Aye, Stubbsy told you. All, all the British based young boys. But we were, we were tight. That dressing room was, was tight. You know, Pierre was a wee bit before, uh, but he still liked to go out. I remember trying to get him in the tunnel one night, you know, and everybody's looking at him. It's not exactly the one that you can hide. But he liked a beer and, you know, sociable. Uh, Good sense of humour, but when it was there to work, he worked and he was time and time again doing his, that free kick, which I think was again, I'm bumming him up here. He's uh -huh. better than Beckham for me with the free kicks. Was he, huh? Uh, he had about size 12 feet as well, didn't he? Know? Massive feet. But he could just, you know, and it was it was practice, it was repetition after uh -huh. training every day. And it, what it did to you, it was kind of showed you, like, that's what I need to do. I need to go out there and, you know, I need to get to that level. I need to put the work in. It was just a good one to have around. Did, uh, did the big man get in the tunnel, huh? Did he what? Did he get in the tunnel? I get in the tunnel. Did he? Aye, aye, aye. Was he the top man in there? Season aye. books at the tunnel in those days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you started the 99, 95, sorry, cup final. Yeah. How nervous is a young guy starting that, that, that game? Again, I'd probably be more nervous now. Again, I was just glad to be involved. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was probably one of the worst games. You know, we got the goal and I don't think there was much else in it. Why, what, what would you put that down to? Why was it no? I think the tension running through. I think, see, if you looked at all the other players who had went that six years or whatever it was without a trophy, which is unbelievable, unthinkable for somebody like Celtic, but 
the next days, the Grants had been through it all before, they'd won all the trophies before, the next day was the skipper, TB was back as manager. We'd get beat against Rafe Rovers in the, the League Cup earlier on, so the huge pressure was there to just win the game. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, that's what we did, but it will not get done as a classic, but probably an important one for us. See that six years without a trophy, would that be spoken about before the game? Tommy, would no, you use but, it his team talk? Nah, but you would just know. Just you know, just know. Uh-huh. You, you, you wouldn't be allowed not to know with the support behind you. You just knew, and it's not acceptable for Celtic. And, McStay had missed the penalty against Rafe Rovers, you know, a huge pressure on his shoulders and you, you look back at the footage for that 95 one, uh, it's relief, it's a similar to the 98, it's relief, you know, mm. that it's not really celebration, it's relief. How would, how would Tommy have been in the dressing room after a, a Scottish Cup one? He was brilliant, we went through the Gallagher and the way back, open top bus this year was the first one, but mm-hmm. he, if he did an open top bus he'd have tried, you know, we, we, he says I want to go through down that way and take it through to see all the Celtic supporters. That that was the first thing, you know, and his his thoughts after it, you know, it was let's get the, the fans involved. And I remember us going through obviously it was the it was the coach, but it was still great scenes. You know, it was as close to an open top bus as I've experienced. Uh-huh. He would have loved that, eh? Oh he loved it. Uh-huh. He loved it. Uh, 95, 96 season we said only lost one game, I lost the league. Is there anything that could have been done differently that maybe would have won you the league? I don't draw. Don't draw, draw 12 or 13. Shoot Andy Gorham, eh? <laughs> <laughs> or take Andy Gorham. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How good was that Rangers team, though? They were brilliant. They were brilliant. We played them. At that time, if you look back in any of the games, phew, there was so many times that we started the game really well, playing a lot of good football. You're thinking, we're getting a foothold in the game here. And Loudrop would break away, or Gaza would break away, or Coyster would pop up with something. And the more it happened, the more deflated you got because you're like, here it, here it goes again. Uh, so it was really difficult at that time. Uh, but they had some really good players. Mm-hmm. I mean, international players right through their team. A lot of them for Scotland, a lot of great foreigners. Loudrop, one of the best I've played against. Gascoigne, unbelievable. So it was difficult. Mm-hmm. So it kind of made it sweeter in 98, obviously, when we stopped it. But at the time, it was nice. It was nice. See guys like Pierre in that? Did they realise what all for a meant? I don't know if they did before they arrived, but they certainly did, you know, once they started playing in them. I think somebody asked me that about Lubo the other night, and I thought, well, if you look back at Lubo's reaction when he scores at Celtic Park against Rangers, Mm -hmm. he's kind of looking around like, what's just happened? You know, it's, I think, until you've actually experienced playing in that game, you can't really explain it. Uh So with guys like Peter Grant and Paul McStay, what would they be like before an North Firm game? Granty would be up for it. Granty would be quite vocal. The heart less so. He'd just be more focused. Is Paul, Paul kind of led by example, which I liked. You know, he mm-hmm. didn't really... They kind of bounced off each other really well. But again, in that... You talk about modern day. At that time, dressing rooms kind of managed themselves. You had kind of senior figures in the dressing room that kind of managed it. Mm-hmm. And the, the gaffer didn't really need to keep on top of a lot of stuff. He'd pick the team and... You know, everybody else, you knew your job. Uh, so think that, that was a good good, good way to be back Aye, then. aye. 100%. And it's missing now. Gen- older players, the older players are missing now. Certain places, yeah, I do, aye. I don't think they've got that kind of... I mean, Bruni, I would imagine, will do it at Celtic. Uh, Kenny Miller, my bet Rangers, but I don't think they have that much. You know, in our dressing room, there was five, six, seven. You know, and then the, with the younger ones, it, at times, would generally, you'd be scared to actually say anything. You know, you'd... You know your place, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is a good thing. I think nowadays young boys get in the first team. Not everybody, but a lot, and they think they've made it, and they want to start saying this and start doing that instead of just concentrating on their jobs. There's youngins too much to say for themselves, isn't there? No, I'm just sound, <laughs> sounding old, aren't I? I'm just sounding old. Uh, 96, 97, the three amigos are formed. How good were they three? They were Together. great. They were great again. They were great. Uh, again, the, the shape of the team had to change a wee bit. You know, I found myself... Not playing as much forward, maybe in a more kind of right-sided role. It's a bit of a graveyard shift, that right side role. It's a graveyard it? shift, <laughs> aye, especially when, uh, we'll touch on it later in the 98s, when Jackie was out, the graveyard shift, when you're properly going that way, it's uh-huh. horrendous. Uh, but the, 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 the shape was tweaked to kind of get them in it, but they were all, they were all brilliant. Uh, the Canio's technique, you know, and the way he trained, I've never seen somebody train as hard as Paolo. Mm-hmm. Uh, is he demanding on you? He was demanding on himself. He fell out with everybody and himself regularly. <laughs> he would always... So you know, walk <laughs> off and walk up to Celtic Park, wouldn't he? Aye, aye. He'd fight with 
He had a fight with Big Marsh, uh, which I think they'd only been one winner, if I'm being honest. Big Marsh, uh -huh. Paolo. But there was an altercation between the two of them, and then it went to him and TB, and TB sent him up the road, the way you go up the road. And I remember thinking, that's the end of Paolo, because you don't mess with Tam. An hour later, we're back up at Celtic Park, the two of them were kissing and cuddling. Uh -huh. So he, he knew what he had with Paolo, and he knew that he couldn't stand for what, you know, it was a wee bit petulant. Get him up the road, once it cools down, give him the wee armour in the, the shoulder. Management. Uh -huh. Management. Did it annoy the other boys though? Because see, the three guys, they kind of got all the credit, I felt. Did it not annoy the other players? Nah, because, ugh, see, if you've got boys in the team that are actually winning games for you, you don't, you don't mind, you know. Somebody said to me about Cantona coming in to want something with a suit on different to the rest, and mm -hmm. somebody said, fair you let my way with it, but it doesn't matter because he was, he was winning games for United, and if you're doing it on the pitch, players will tolerate it. Mm -hmm. And they, they, at that time, they were doing it on the pitch. Would day three ever think they were above the other boys around there? Paolo, 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 huh? Paolo walking into places with his shades on. He loves his and cell. He loves his cell, but he can carry it. You know, uh, he can he can do it on the pitch, so it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Would he come on the night suit when he arrived? Paolo, I don't really remember being on many nights. I think he'd maybe be away doing his own thing. Uh, but you couldn't question his ability. He was, he's a one-off Paolo. I, I seen him doing it. We played in the Star Sixes last year, doing it uh, the O2, and he was there. And again, I watched them one day. We were on the canteen, and it's all World Cup winners with France, Brazil. We're all eating together and it was brilliant. And I went up to get my breakfast and I can see Paolo walking along the corridor. And as he just gets to the door of the dining room, the shades go on. <laughs> and he struts in and I'm thinking, why, why are you doing that? But He's a nutcase, isn't he? That's just him. I watched the Star Sixes and it was like Del Piero and ah, was brilliant. Playing. It was brilliant. And the camera flashes to the side of the pitch and he's screaming at Decani, uh, Del Piero Aye. on the big... He's not even played uh, if he wins it. Nah, but... Brilliant, eh? You want to win. You want to uh, win all the time. Uh, just a wee bit on the <laughs> Elfo on Tuesdays. What's your memory? Is that, who was the top man? Was it Big Stubbs? P El Pavone. Uh -huh. Stubbs, eh? Aye, Stubbs was up there. Pavone was brilliant. Pavone was, you know, we went in there... It was on a Tuesday, you'd have something to eat. Some days we'd just go home, other days it'd be like, right, we're out, we'll go to TGI's and we're kicking on to trash. Because he always had a Wednesday off. And it just grew, you know, there was bonds there. Uh, that's where friendships, you know, you can do it on the training pitch. You go for a beer, we home truths come out, bit of banter. And then you want to do it for each other on the pitch even more because there's a, a relationship there. And they, they times were brilliant. I'd, I'd uh, a couple of birthdays in there. You know, accidentally just fell on my birthdays. Mm -hmm. And they got wind of it and they, they done me a cracker because the place was mobbed. It was just leading up to Christmas. My birthdays at the start of December. And they got a stripper in and it was a big girl. And uh, she came in and they were videoing it. I had a, I, I've got a VHS yet somewhere where I, I need to hide that or burn it. <laughs> and they wanted me, the whole of Il Provone, the whole of Princess Square were there. I was going bright red. And they wanted me to get down to my boxers. Thankfully, I managed to drop the shoulder and... Get Shut at it. it and run away, aye. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're doing. Who'd organised that big? It'd have been the Scouser, the job, the Mike Namara would have been involved. Mm -hmm. But you know that way when you know something's happening and they're all kind of looking at their watches and they're looking over at you and they've coddled me into it. And I was like, what's happening here? And then this happened and that was embarrassing. Oh, it was uh, you and Jackie always the best of mates back aye. then? Aye, aye, because we'd, we'd known each other for the 21s and then he signed in 95. And there was an age, there was a wee age gap between me and a lot of the boys were, you know, late twenties going towards thirty. So there was a wee dip down to myself, early twenties, and he was the same age as me. And we'd got on at twenty ones, and I kind of went out my way to make him feel welcome. We came from Dunfermline to a huge club at Celtic, where it must be I, I never did it that way. You know, I came through, you know, from the ground staff. So I'd always been there. I didn't really know anything else. I'd been at Queens Park six months, but Jack had established his son the Dunfermline team. And I just wanted to make him feel welcome, and we, we had it off for the start with similar, you know, likes and hobby golf, fat music, strippers, fat strippers, <laughs> uh, and you know we just clicked. We just uh -huh. clicked. Top player, uh -huh. great player, great player, intelligent player. Underrated. I think he might have been underrated a wee bit at the start with Martin O'Neill, but I think to 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 Jackie's credit, you know, he he, he fought through all that. You know, he, he missed out in big games. He fought through it and ended up. Martin's skipper. Uh -huh, brilliant. Uh, see, just on the Tuesdays, would Tommy not mind you all going to have a, or would he quite like it? No, because that was just... A done thing back then. Back then, it's 20, 25 years ago. 
You know, yeah. football's changed a wee bit, and I, I, sometimes I don't think it's for the best, but, you know, those days, you, you knew you were training, Mondays, Tuesdays would always be hard, maybe double sessions. Mm -hmm. You would go out, you would be off on the Wednesday, you'd be back in, you got your balls off Thursday, Friday, and your game on Saturday. You know, and if you had a European game or a midweek game, obviously the, the Tuesday would be out. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't every single Tuesday, but it, it did, it created a bond, you know, and I, I think sometimes, I went to Sheffield Wednesday, for example, after it, and... You know, you'd guys for Leeds, you'd guys for down south. And after training, everybody went home. You know, there was no real camaraderie. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of missed that. Would Tommy ever come on the Tuesdays now? No, no, no he'd always, draw the line yeah, he'd always leave it. I think they took us to the Belfry one time. Uh, and that was the only time he kind of, him and Stark had a couple of beers with us. But then again, they would they'd have a couple of beers with you and then they'd leave you to it. Right, OK. Uh, what was what caused the eventual issues at Celtic then with Tommy Burns? When did the trouble? When did you start to think we were in trouble here? We lost in the semi final. Was know, there a bit of a Barney after it? It wasn't so much a Barney, but I think he just, you know, there was a lot of pressure on us at the time, uh, and I think that was just the, the straw that broke the camel's back. I don't, I don't really agree with it because I think the football that he'd produced and the players that he'd, he'd brought to the club, I think he would have done it again. I think he did. I, I, I can only regret that season that we, we got beat once. He should have, we should have won the league that year, you know, and if there was somebody that deserved it, it was it was TB. Could you tell after that game that Tommy would be getting, would be leaving? I felt that was the beginning of the end, I, I did. I just, because you, you can just sense things in the media and stuff and the atmosphere around the place. Uh, aye, that was, you know, that was the first time that I kind of really felt you know, for a manager losing his job because you had that relationship with him. Uh, it was a, a sad time, eh? See, the three guys we were talking about, like, obviously when things are going well, it's great, but see guys like that, when it's no going so good, are they hard people to bear in? The three amigos? Uh, in the dressing room. It's no easy. It's no easy because I think when, before them came in, I think we played a qualifier in a cable tell, I think it was, for, for, for Europe. And Paolo was having his, his problems with the club at the time. And I thought he should just have played. I thought he should just have, you know, came and helped the boys. And I'd, I don't know if he refused to play, but he never played. And I thought that was a bit off, you know. I thought he should have played that game, you know. And if he's got contract problems or issues, he could have done it after the game. I don't know the ins and outs, but, you know, I thought he should have played for us there and helped the team. Would, none, like, would Peter Grant not pull them up for it now? Hard? Ah, it's difficult. It's difficult. Peter got on, I mean, for the time Decanio was there, Peter got on really well. Well, did it was yeah. it was larger in life as you've probably seen yourself. Yeah. But the toys went out the pram there a wee bit, and I thought he should have stuck around. What uh, what was the reaction amongst the other boys when when Tommy left? Gutted. Everybody was gutted, almost to a, to a man, if not a man. You know, yeah. as I say, the impression that he leaves on people, the environment he created there for us to play, it was it was. Brilliant, you know, I mean, I went on to win the league in 98, but that's that team and that football was probably the most I enjoyed playing. You know, some of the football we played that year was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody was, was gutted when he left. Would, would he speak to you all before he left? Aye, aye. Individually or is it? No, I think he, he spoke to his... Uh, if I remember rightly, he took us in as a group. But I remember, I think I, I texted him or phoned him after it just to thank him for, for what he'd done for me because, as I said earlier on, he's, he was a huge... Huge role, and not just for me, because I've, I've, when I went back as a coach later on, your McGiddies, your Maloney's, nobody's got a bad word to say about the guy. The Ferries. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Si. That's all right. <laughs> uh, well, so what were your thoughts when the wee Dutchman, Wim Janssen, came in? Great Barnett. Uh, uh, oh, brilliant Barnett. I had no idea who he was. Total ignorant towards it. There'd been other names bandied about, and we get Vim, and he comes over to Holland. I think Murdo had took the start of pre-season, and it was roasting. And he comes in with this ridiculous... Celtic shell suit on, obviously thought I better get the colours on, put the shell suit on, walks across the train pitch to introduce himself to the boys with the, the perm and everyone is was like, who is this guy? But he then starts to speak and he's calm and he's training. Again, I was really suited, I think, to Tommy's training. I, was, I think I was suited to, to the Vims. It was, everything was with the ball. You know, it was all to the whistle. Everything was structured really well. But it was none of this going run here, run there, it was everything, we were working hard, but it was all with the ball, typical Dutchman, uh, and I, I liked him, you know, him and, him and TB were my two favourite. 
He, I always thought, always thought he looked like a wee woman for the gallery. Did you know, I think that he must have perm? His perm didn't do him any favours, yeah. but he could carry it off because somebody pulled him up one day. It wasn't even about his perm. Somebody pulled him up, and I still don't know who the player was. I was asking Boyd the other night, and he says, see, when you've played in two World Cup finals, you can come back and talk to me. And he just clamped him. Brilliant. It was brilliant. Did was he have that in his locker, nah, didn't he? And it was funny because he didn't think he had it in his locker because up until then, quiet, unassuming, he says... When you've played in two World Cups, you come back to me and whoever it was, I don't know. They wouldn't have pulled like, them up again. Uh, uh. So 97, 98, would you say that was your best best season in a Celtic shirt? Aye, for what we achieved, aye. The 95, 96, some great football, but 98 got me the title, obviously, mm -hmm. and got me to the World Cup. So it's probably my most successful season. And double figures that year? 16. What did you put that didn't you? Playing up front? I played up front with Henrik for the first part and I loved it. I loved playing with Henrik. It was one of the highlights of my career. After the first, we had a shitty start. Obviously, we lost the first two games. But once we got into the flow of things, I think I played one of the European games. It was the... That's where you coming, but... Aye. Uh, that was uh, the one that Darren had the head issue with his yeah. brain. And I came in and we played Tyrrell and I did well. Found myself on the team with Henrik for the next period till Harold came in. Uh, that was that was one of the highlights of my career. It was so easy to play them. It was so clever. And then I get shifted to the graveyard shift when <laughs> Harold came in. Came back, yeah. Well, uh, could you tell straight away that Larson was, was a top player or did it take, take a while? I knew of him. Again, we're talking about Barmots. Mm -hmm. I remember his Barmot in 94 when Sweden got to the third and fourth playoff in the World Cup. Mm -hmm. So I knew of him that way. You know, he stuck out. He came to the club. You could tell he was a player for the start. But I, I, I said this before as well, I think... After, I was with him for two seasons, but see, after I think Celtic gave him the platform and the confidence to go and elevate himself again. I think he went to even higher levels after yeah. I left, you know, 40, 50 goals a season. You could certainly tell there and then that he could play, but I think he improved as he went. Did you talk to each other about like, your game, or was it, did you just click naturally? No, I just, nah, it was the same as Charlie Nick. You just, good player, you just know. You just know. You don't really sit there and analyse it, and you can go out and once you start playing with boys like that, you know where they're going to be. It was like me and Jackie in the right. You, you knew if I was cutting in, you knew he was outside me without even looking, mm -hmm. without him even shouting, you just knew. And it was the same with Henrik. It was brilliant. And I've been lucky enough to play with him a couple of times recently and now the kind of charity games again. Mm -hmm. It's just rolled back the years. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Did he have the same sort of attitude as a Decano or an Ivan Hoydon? No. No, he was, he was uh, a lot more quiet. A lot more quiet. Uh, Use the word again, unassuming. It was quite to the point at the beginning that the boys, you weren't sure how to take him at the start, you know, and then you kind of warmed him, you know, once barriers kind of came down mm -hmm. and you got to know him. But no, just a, a gentleman, actually, just a, a really unassuming guy, you know, no airs or graces, there to do his job. He did it rather mm -hmm. well, didn't So he? did that bond for Tommy continue into Wim's, Wim's time in charge? And with the, the, the group? Boys, uh -huh. Aye, aye, aye. Even though the, the foreigners were all coming in, you know, Mark Reapers and everyone were coming in. But they were all good guys, you know, and it would only take one night out with them to, you know, they all enjoyed a beer. The Scandinavians enjoyed a beer. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bond was there. That bond was really probably the tightest because all the girlfriends or the wives got on. A couple of kids on the go at the time, but everybody did stuff as a group, mm -hmm. you know, and that was, for me, the dressing room that I, I take most of my friends from because it was quite a tight one. That doesn't happen in football anymore, right? Doesn't it doesn't People Sad. just... Ships in the night. Uh -huh. Wish I could, we need to get it back. Um, ten in a row, stop them ten in a row. How early on in that season did you think that this, this team's capable of doing it? Well, it wasn't after the first two games. No. <laughs> <laughs> beat Easter Road, beat it home to Dunfermline, thinking pff, a lot of new players in. Vim's still trying to make his mark. I'm like, what's going on here? And we went to St Johnson, we won on the Saturday, and then we won in the Cup at St Johnson on the Tuesday or the Wednesday. And it took the pressure off us a wee bit, but it was Liverpool. I thought, we played Liverpool over two legs. We didn't go through, we were out and away goals. But the performances, I thought then, I get the confidence for that, thinking we've, we're actually decent here. you know. Mm -hmm. And the boys had began to gel because I think there was seven or eight new players came in. So that that game for me was the one that, you know, we're actually half decent here. We could make a, a, a race for this. Mm -hmm. And we thought you'd go with one, uh, it'd stop 10 in a row. Yeah. Like Erskine Bridge's brother, Falconbridge. Falconbridge. Um, 
How, <laughs> bitches. You'd be thinking that one, <laughs> <laughs> not you? I just, I just came out of there. Um, how gutted were you when he equalised? Oh, man. I've been asked that question, so, because it's 20 years, uh -huh. and I've been doing a few things, and I've been asked about it. Do you remember his name? I was like, how can I forget his name? Uh, per on a personal note, it would have been brilliant. It was probably one of the most important points of Celtic's history, and for me to get the goal to take us over the line would have been brilliant. It was not to be. Goldie shouldn't have came for the ball. He gets stuck in no man's land. Falkenbridge up with a header, and it was back to Celtic Park. You can look at it the other way, we get back to Celtic Park and we win it in front of 60,000, but that week, we could have done it without that week, you know, the pressure. That's what I was going to say, how was that week leading up to it? <sighs> I think just coming back, because I think everybody involved with Celtic was through it, don't feel Rangers had been beat with Kilmarnock on the Saturday. Uh, I remember being on the phone to Jake in the car, you know, he crashed the car, Ali Mitchell scores, we're going to do it tomorrow. So everybody's expecting it at East End Park, mm -hmm. doesn't it happen, you're like... But we still went out on the Tuesday. We still went out Did on the you? Tuesday, aye. And oh, yeah. Looking back on it now, you're thinking, see if it hadn't worked out on the Saturday, but there was no social media as such back then, you know. Mm -hmm. But we did. Boy, they got us all out for a Chinese and a few beers. Like we always did. Mm -hmm. Just tried to keep it as simple and <coughs> as normal as possible. Uh, <coughs> and we got to the Saturday and we get the early goal and you're thinking, right, normally this is a 3, 4, 5 nil job. And it stays 1-0. And you can tell for the crowd that Rangers have got a result, mm -hmm. you know, at Tannadice. And then I get taken off for Harold, about an hour in, 65 minutes in, and you just, I've said this, you just, that was the most nervous I was, see that 25 minutes, you're sitting in the dugout and you can't do a thing. That was the most nervous I was, till the second goal goes in, and then it's, again, relief, just relief. See the team talk before it, was it different to the other ones all season? No, exact same? no, somebody asked me that as well, it was just, uh, I don't even remember it, sorry, to be honest. Yeah. I think everybody just knew what they had to do, I think there was no... Weird and wonderful, you know, this is what we needed. Just go and win the game. Mm -hmm. Win the game, do your job. If everybody does their job, we'll win. And that's You must have been nervous before that game. I was more nervous when I came off. Came out of yeah, and watching. I was there. more nervous when I came off. I was because you're when you're on the pitch you can do something, you can affect it. When you're off, you can't, you're just a fan. Mm -hmm. Was that the best experience of your career? Best aye, moment? Aye. Aye. Do you that remember was... the scenes after? Everybody was on the pitch. I jumped on poor John Clark's back at the second goal. I'm surprised they could carry me. <laughs> uh, but no, the, we, we all went in, we came back out. The park, you couldn't see a blade of grass. Everybody was on the pitch. We had to go to Portugal the next day. We had a game where we had to fly out to Portugal. It was something to do with the George Cadet signing. We right. were obliged to play sport in Lisbon. You imagine? Imagine the next day. Last time you wanted to game of football, the state, We were on flying out there. And where I, did you I, go that night? <clears throat> we went to... Where did we go that night? I think we went to a wee place, Il Castello, over in Merns. Right. And we had our kind of wee private function, but we were all aware that we had to be at the airport in the morning, first thing. As I say, there was a few states, we flew out there. And I, I had to play the game, I had to play 90 minutes the next night. No way. And I, I remember Jackie throwing one in, Darren Jackson <laughs> throwing one in. They sat in the coach and drank beers, they didn't even come in to watch the Watching game. It's <laughs> <laughs> true. Why did you know that? <clears throat> I don't know, we didn't have a lot of players and it, it just kind of get, he probably thought about it before me. So uh, as soon as Jackie goes the right side, uh, you can play Sid, uh, uh, you'll play. 90 minutes, something done. How did you do? Well, I thought I did all right considering I was still pissed, but <laughs> I think it was nil-nil, the game was nil-nil. I don't even think there was a lot of people there, it was just a, we had a couple of good nights in Portugal after it, uh -huh. which made up for it. Brilliant. Uh, the World Cup, selected yeah. to go, never, yeah. really, never played. Never played. How was the experience for you, so good? It was the best summer holiday I've had, the free holiday, mm -hmm. because you were training with the boys in the morning, you were lying at the pool in the afternoon, the food in the hotel were great, you were watching games. Unfortunately, I never played. Why, why not? Why do you think you never played? Because he went, he's tried and trusted. It was quite an experienced squad with some really good players. <clears throat> I was one of the younger ones, and I should have read the signs. We went out for the Brazil game, which was a brilliant experience, walking out in the kilts, and I'm sitting in the dugout, and it was me, Jackie, and we'd hampered boys, uh, so it was Mark Burchill, Dan Young, Kieran McInnesby, and the boy Gallagher, uh, the goalkeeper. Paul, oh, Paul, uh, Paul. Scott Gallagher, sorry. Paul. Oh, Paul, Paul Gallagher, right, okay. And we were sitting in the dugout, you know, just as uh, before we get ready to go out and play, and Craig Brown turned around and he went, Donnelly, McNamara, Burchill, Young, there's 2002, and where was the World Cup in 2002? Career or whatever. Mm. There's 2002, and I thought, 
you know, if that was already in his head, whether he was talking about that's the future, but I thought, I'm here now at 24 and 98, I want to play here. Mm. So I should have read the signs there and then. Would you ever go and say to him, like, why am I not playing? Nah, nah. I just wanted to perform and I was 24, it wasn't in my nature. I wanted to perform in training and show, you know, I'm good enough, give us a chance. Mm -hmm. But it never came. Uh, as I say, I went with the guys that had got us there, which understandable. Morocco game came around. Uh, we're three 0 down. Butler gets sent off, and he sent me and Scott Booth to warm up. And it was one sub left, and I'm thinking, just stick us on. All my family are here, and the family are only here. They're back home watching the telly. Just put me on, so I can see I've played that World Cup. He's moved his back in. Scott Booth went on. Killer mate. <laughs> so that was, that was, me, that was me in holiday mode after that. Uh -huh. Just holidays now. Who was uh, who was the best player you seen at that World Cup? Zidane. Is he frightening? Huh? He's really right. Uh -huh. we, we went to France's first game. I think it was against South Africa. Ronaldo was unbelievable until he took unwell for the final. But Zizou uh -huh. was top man. Class, uh -huh, he's some man. Eh? Uh, you left Celtic in '99. Did you want to leave? I did. I, I made I made the choice. I made the choice. Why? Because I've been there seven years. And seven years in the goldfish bowl, you know, for a guy who wasn't overly, quite a shy guy at the time, uh, and they were in the Premiership, I think it was Sheffield Wednesday and Everton gave me the opportunity to go down there. Walter Smith was a manager at Everton, but the, the Sheffield Wednesday th thing came about for me and Phil. And I, I made the decision, you know, uh, people have asked me over the years and I get a lot of stick because it was a Bosman. Me and mm -hmm. Phil get a lot of stick, you know, why are you leaving and stuff. But we made the decision... And I stand by it. Uh, I would say that I never played uh, that level of football ever again. And that was them in the, sh uh, the, the prim English Premiership. And I kind of knew that after five or six weeks. And it was no disrespect to anybody that I played with at Sheffield. But, you know, as soon as I went on pre-season with them and looked around the dressing room, I thought, I've left a better dressing room, quality-wise, to come here. Mm -hmm. So whether that you say that's a mistake, I don't know. But I, I've, I certainly didn't play at that level again. You know, the European Knights, the Rangers games... Uh, playing at Celtic Park, it was never quite, it was never the same again. Uh, so I, I regret that, but again, if you look at it from a, a different angle, I had a lot of good times at Sheffield. Uh, my first boy was born there. I had four years with Phil. Mm -hmm. You know, we lived in each other's pockets, and you know everything that's happened with Phil. You know that necessarily wouldn't have happened at Celtic because although we were tight at Celtic, he, he goes to Hamilton, and I'm a penny school bride. There we were living in each other's pockets mm -hmm. for four years. As a short career, did money have a part to play? Aye, because it was a great contract on the table. Mm -hmm. It was a fantastic contract on the table and it's like every other walk of life, you know, if you if you're gonna be offered that as well, aye, you're not gonna say no. But that wasn't the sole reason, you know, there was a lot of stuff there that you go, right, okay, I want to give it a try. I might not get the chance again at twenty four, you might not get another chance. Mm -hmm. I look back at forty three, maybe I should have stuck a bit in Celtic. Mm -hmm. Maybe you got a testimonial, mate. And you'd have made a few quid. <laughs> 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 uh, so how would you look back on your Celtic career? Successful, good, you know, great education coming through, what a way to start my football career, playing with guys of that calibre, lucky enough to win every domestic, be involved in one of the most important times of the club's history, stopping the, the Rangers 10. Aye, happy. Uh -huh. Right mate, on to your coaching. Did you and Jackie always talk about it while he was no, there playing? No, Did you think he would always be a manager? <clears throat> He, we had a place in France and he, he, we were down there a, year, a couple of years before when he was at Falkirk and somebody got the bullet at Falkirk and him and Neil McCann, he was on the phone to Terry, they were wanting to put their names in for it, <clears throat> never materialised, so that's when I kind of knew he wanted to get into that, he was doing his A licence at the time, I think I did my B, but then <clears throat> he came back and he signed for party, Ian McCall speaks to me and I, I says look, I'll, I'll try and get Jackie here, you know he'll improve the team. As a player? Uh -huh. As a player, yeah. aye. He comes back and I'm thinking this is going to be great because we've started our careers essentially at Celtic. We're going to finish our playing careers at Partick. We're going to have a, a season or two together. We went down to Somerset and I was playing up top and he was in midfield, I think. And I've made a run and he's found me with it and I've made an asset. Should have scored. But at that wee point, I'm thinking this is going to be brilliant because I'm make, he can see it. I'm making mm. runs and he can see it. He broke his leg that night. Somebody had done him and he broke his leg. It was a real bad break and it more or less finished him. Fast forward towards the end of that season, Ian McCall lost his job and he says, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to put my name in and I want you to be my, my number two. So that was the first time I'd really thought about the coaching. Mm -hmm. Up until then I was kind of maybe 50-50, hadn't really gave it a lot of thought. And I said, right, okay. So he got the job 
and we had five games. It was temporary, so we got five games to kind of prove ourselves towards the end of that season. And I said to him, I says, listen, I'm 35. Do you want me? I can go out there and I can still play. Mm -hmm. He says, no, I want you sitting beside me, eyes and ears in the dugout. So to this day, he's the guy that retired me. And he loves to, <laughs> he loves to tell everybody that. He loves to tell everybody that. I could, have, I could have played for another couple of years if it wasn't for him. See, as a player, though, did you always think Jackie would be a manager? I thought he had the leadership skills, aye. To get into, to get into that Celtic team, I look back, the Celtic team and captain it with Henrik, Lenny, Lambert, Thompson, Sutton, and be the captain. There was no doubt in his leadership skills. <clears throat> I still think he's got a lot to offer. I think he's he's scunnered about the now a wee bit because of what happened at, at York and, and Dundee United, but I still think he's got a lot to offer. Uh -huh. So five games in temporary charge, do you love it? Uh -huh. It was nerve-wracking. It was like 24-7 and it was nothing I'd experienced before because you know yourself, see when you're a player, you just concentrate on yourself. Uh -huh. But when you get to that level, it's like there's 20 boys there, you need to prepare training, you need to deal with somebody, this. There was a lot of going on, not even to do with football. So it was five games that phew, I, I can't really remember. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we did enough to get the job. I think we won maybe two, lost two, and drew one. But it was a it was a crazy period. How and did you find dealing with players and stuff like that? It was all new, but I just I, I just tried to treat players the way that you wanted to be treated as a player. I tried mm -hmm. to put training sessions on that I, I would have liked as a player. That that's how I went about my coaching. Just mm -hmm. you put yourself in the, the players shoes would they respond or would I respond to this and that's how I try to do it mm -hmm. uh, and it worked how satisfied with the job you done at Thistle good job he's done eh did a great job at Thistle yeah. done a great job at Thistle because the first year we didn't have a lot of money uh, Jackie was paying for that pre-season Jackie was paying for things out of his own pocket at times uh, wow. we tried to get players in you know players at second chance Lawless Murrow hadn't really worked for him mm -hmm. Ross Forbes, Mother had hadn't worked for him, Welsh for, for Hibs. But it took us a year to get to that. And then the start of the year that we went on to win it, you know, we started flying and I think we battered Morton five, we battered Airdrie eight. And you're thinking, these are games that the party fans will not forget. Mm -hmm. And then the Dundee United thing came about, I probably know the ideal time, around about January when we're pushing for a title, I think, with Morton. And, you know, Jackie felt, it was too good an opportunity. There was a lot of good youth players at Dundee United and there was a, there was a platform there that they could go and build on. Mm -hmm. And he decided to make the make the move and of course I went with him. Uh, and Archie took that team, you know, for the, the second part of the season and got them over the line. Big club Dundee United, eh? Massive club. Massive. Again, a step up, I thought, you know, and we went there, we beat Rangers in our first game in the Scottish Cup. Uh, hit the ground running. Some big characters there, we lost a lot at the, at the end of that season, had to bring in some, big Van Hooydonk brought his Sifji to their yeah, attention, yeah. Uh, we brought a few other ones in, brought Peyton and Erskine for Partick who we worked with, but you were inheriting young boys there that were coming through that we worked with, your goals, your suitors, who we played out here against Celtic at 16 because they were that good, mm -hmm. uh, Johnny Russell was there we, for a, a short period. But that following season was, was was brilliant for us. We got to the cup final. And I remember what, I was at Portsmouth and I used to watch the highlights on a Monday down, down <coughs> south and I actually couldn't believe the football down the United were playing. How did you, how, was it just the players or did you just have a certain way of getting them to play like that? Allow them to go and play and give them the encouragement and the belief to go and play. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we brought Andy Robertson in to Queen's Park and we didn't know how, we thought, we believed in Andy but we didn't know if he was going to hit the ground running, which he did. You know, pre-season, he forced his hand, I'm going to be your left back. <clears throat> but we never said to Andy, stay there or whatever, just play your own game. If you get forward, somebody else will fill in for you. I think he scored four or five goals that season. Mm -hmm. He was rampaging down that left-hand side. It was For us, it was a joy to watch. And then he's away at the Premiership in one year because we couldn't keep him. Mm -hmm. Wee Gold was brilliant as well, wasn't he? Gold was unbelievable. Is that a bit sad that he's not he's no playing? I spoke to somebody recently and I think he's enjoying life in Portugal and mm -hmm. I, I think he'll be gaining huge experience, but... I'd have loved to have kept him for another season. I think he'd, another season he'd have, he'd have banged in maybe double figures, mm -hmm. 15, 20 goals, you know, he was just improving. And I thought to go to sport, and you can't again stand in a boy's way, you know, it was a great deal for him going to sport in Lisbon. He'd always wanted to play in Europe. He was a, kind of different to the rest. He'd always said, I want to play in Europe. So he got his, his chance. And I think he's enjoying it, but I would, I think he should be in the Scotland team now. You know, I think that's where it's maybe stuttered a wee bit for him, but... 
He's got all the ability to come back and get in the Scotland. The other players you want to see playing for Scotland, oh, eh? the can play ahead. Uh, so what point did the momentum stop at United? When did it start to get a bit? When we lost, things starting to go we wrong? started losing our best players. Uh-huh. And did you have any <coughs> control on that now? Nothing. Nothing. Contrary to what people say. Uh-huh. You know, the dafties out there think that we sold the players. Why would you want to sell your best players? Uh-huh. But uh, that got turned on us a wee bit. The pressure got turned on us for that last six months. We brought in other good ones, you know, we brought in Blair Spittles, uh, we Charlie Telfer, it started off really well and then it didn't work out for him. But it was an environment where the kids, you know, were under huge pressure. The team weren't doing well and it went from everything flying high and you could dip boys in, you know, if a team's doing well, uh-huh. dip them in, to a point where you could almost see the boys kind of going within themselves, which is understandable. It ultimately led to us losing our jobs, but I think it was a bit premature. He's never offered to leave Dundee United because at one stage he was absolutely flying. He's the hottest managerial duo going to be. That, that January when it changed and we lost the players, you, you could have justified looking to go elsewhere, but us being us, we wanted to try and change it. We thought we'd done it <coughs> once before, we can do it again. We had belief in the boys that we had coming in, but we didn't get the time. Is that the frustrating thing? Being at a club like Dundee United, you do lose your best players and it's hard to replace them. It is, it is. You can't pull rabbits out the hat every year. You know, yeah. It takes time with boys. Boys develop at different ages or, 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 or pace, you know, it's a difficult one, you know, you can't just go, right, we've lost those three, like, let's get these in here. Mm-hmm. I think the, the losing the two leading up to the, the League Cup final didn't help us, you know, Stuart and Gaz to, to sell it. Like but again, it. how can you stop the boys, you know, if they want to go and, you know, enhance their careers, how can you really stop them? Mm-hmm. I think, uh, looking back, probably losing the, the Scottish Cup, you know, didn't help us either. You know, Johnston was in uh, there. lost and... All our good players that day kind of didn't really turn up for whatever reason, you know, because I think you talk about the, the 95 or the 98, if you do your job, we should have beat St Johnson. Mm-hmm. They had a wee bit of a kind of hold over us that year, you know, they were our kind of bogey team, but if your Sifties, Robertsons, Golds, Armstrongs were all firing at top top game, we'd have won that game, and on that day, they were not Like you say, you get a bit of stick for the United fans, I mean, the, we'll the names stick. you've just <laughs> we'll ringed off, mate, that you have brought through. <laughs> Aye. So unjustified, isn't it? Ach, mate, it's football. It's football. I think I'd like to think there's sensible people out there that would see the job we did there and at Partick, but a lot of it gets swept under the, the carpet. It doesn't really bother me, because uh, it it's just football. Uh-huh. Sad though, eh? Because when I was at Dundee, mate, see, playing against you, the, the football you played was... Aye, was a, and then you look at how see, United have went see, since. See, for a coaching point of view as well, see when you're... See when you're standing there at times, whether it was the Partick games, the 5 0 and 8 now, or the, when we, I think at Dundee United we were going 4 4 4 5 4. Ridiculous, a wee period. Mm-hmm. You're standing there, and you become a supporter. You're like, this is this is what we want. This is, it's called entertainment. Go and entertain the football. And that's what we were doing at that point. And I think a lot of the fans will not forget those games. Like Celtic fans come to me about the 95 96, although we didn't win it, they remember the football that was played. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of your job as a coach to, to get teams performing that way. Uh-huh. So are you going to get back into the coaching? I'm doing a wee bit just now with, with, with Kids Pro Academy. We're doing that. I'll get my plug in because Charlie plugs everything <laughs> when he was here. <laughs> <laughs> Go on mate, get in. <coughs> uh, it's Pro Academy, so it's basically ex-pros like yourself coaching kids, getting into boys clubs, trying to improve stuff. And we've just started up uh, and I think it's going to be good. But desperate to get back into the first team, that's what you should be doing. Eh? You know what, I've been out a year and a half and I, I don't crave it because of the volatile, you could be five games and you're at a job, you're, it's, it's a crazy world football at the, the, the coal face, it's mental, mm-hmm. never say never, I'm 43 but it's, I'm enjoying what I'm doing now. It's guys like you and Jackie we need back in coaching, coaching football players for me I think. I'll give you the 50 quid later. <laughs> Top man, cheers. <laughs> right, cheers mate. Right,